check here. 40 years ago, um, this crazy lady by the name of Pat decided that she would walk down an aisle and marry me. And I'm the most privileged guy in the world. I just want you to know that because she made that decision. Now, has she lived to regret it? There's been times. You that are married know what I'm talking about. If you're newly married, you're going to find out. But I just remember her, and it, and it was a very small church, a church I grew up in. So the aisle was short, and I remember watching her because her eyes were just bugged out. Because when she met me, my hair was past my shoulders. This is 1975 when we met, so you got to understand the 70s. And when the, right a few hours before uh, our wedding, I decided to go get my hair cut, and I cut it all off. Just to freak her out. And then after I did it, I went, what have I done? You know, because it was 1979 by now. I liked my long hair. It kept me warm in the winter. You know, it was still kind of cool. It was just the day we lived in. And I can remember her just like in awe that I'd cut all my hair out. And the reason I did it was to honor her dad. Because her dad was, um, let's just say he was a more traditional guy than me. Thank you, Mike. And he... <laughs> He really didn't like me that much in the beginning. I think he wondered what in the world uh, she was doing marrying me. He was very traditional, conservative, you know, always dressed in a, in a suit when he preached, and, and, which is not a bad thing. And I think he, I think he was just impressed. I think by me cutting my hair, he realized I really meant it when I said I wanted to marry this girl. So I did it to honor him, not to freak her out. But, you know, there's nothing, when I was rethinking that scene in my head a few moments ago, I was thinking about the awesomeness of a bride. I mean, how many of you have been a bride? Just raise your hand, okay? Some, maybe more than once, I don't know, but, uh, you know, you get the idea. And, and, but we've almost all of us have been to a, to a wedding, right? Where we've seen that beautiful woman. I mean, even ugly women look beautiful as they come. Can I say that in church? I'm just being real. There's a glow on her as she walks down that aisle. There's an there's a awesomeness all around her. There's a, everybody stands and looks at her. Nobody does that for the groom. He's standing up there going, where is she? Is she ever going to come down the aisle? You know, he's like, i got to go to the bathroom. When is this thing going to be over? You know, I, don't, I don't know what he's thinking. They think all kinds of things. I've done hundreds and hundreds of weddings. But the beauty of that bride walking down the aisle is awesome, isn't it? But there's something else about a bride because Pat and I went on to have three children and we uh, waited several years before we started. But a bride turns into a mom and the wonder of a family is just incredible as you watch these little toddlers that you bring home that are so beautiful and, and then they scream all night, and they make demands on you and make you do things. They, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, even grandfathers talk in tongues when they see a, a little grandbaby, don't they? You know, they say weird things, and, and, and we just, it changes our life when we have a family. And I remember just, I was 30 when I had my first one. I, I, we waited several years because I just had to get ready, and I wasn't ready at the beginning. And I just remember thinking, wow, this boy and then my girls, my two girls, and then grandbabies came along in the last few years, and, and I've had that joy. And there's nothing more beautiful, secondly, after a bride than a family. Wouldn't you agree? Now, you may say, oh, I don't even like my family. I understand. I don't like your, some of y'all's families either. I, I, I get it, you know. Families also drive us crazy. They're imperfect. You always got Uncle Bob and Aunt Millie. Everybody has an Uncle Bob and Aunt Millie. They just show up at all the family reunions and just drive everybody out. We all have, but, the, but the beauty of what a family does for us, and that's, that's really what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the church. And for the next four weeks, we're going to be talking in a series called Imagine If. Imagine if church was like the church that Jesus originally established. See, somewhere along the way, we've kind of got it messed up. Today, we were having technical problems, but I was worshiping even though we had technical problems. I, I mean, I don't know about you. I didn't know all the words, but I was watching these folks worship up here. I was being quiet in my heart. See, 
I'm just, I mean, I remember one time we just built a, a new building in today's dollars, it'd be about $8 million, and I paid just a million dollars just for the sounds and the lights, man. We had fog machines, and we had, we had things that was just, I mean, it was crazy, it was innovative back in the day. And like the third week, everything blew up. Nothing worked. And they used a piano because it doesn't have to be mic'd, and and, and we were used to this dynamic worship, you know, 32 people on the worship team and this incredible band. And I remember that was one of the most powerful days we ever had in church was when we didn't have all the tech. Now, I like the tech, okay? Don't get me wrong. I like, the, I like all the band and all the instruments. But to understand, we can worship as a family even when we don't have all the bells and whistles. Because we're family. And, 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 and so I want to talk to you about that family that to imagine if the church could be like the church that Jesus originally had in mind from the very beginning. So if you've, got your, if you've got your outline this morning, turn over to the back of your bulletin. I think it's on there. There's two things. I've already given them to you. The church represents a bride, and it also represents a family. Let me just read this verse for you. You don't have to look it up, but this just describes the bride of Christ. In Revelation 21, last book of the Bible, verses 2 and 9 John says, I saw the holy city Jerusalem, talking about the church, coming down from heaven, from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And then in chapter 19 of that same book, he also talks about, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So the church is described as a bride, something beautiful, something wonderful, something that eventually is going to create an offspring, that is a family. And I want to really just dwell upon the family today. In fact, just write this verse down if you don't know it. It's Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. It's the core verse, (coughs) excuse me, for today. And here's what it says. Ephesians 2, 19. Now you are no longer strangers to God or foreigners to heaven, but you're members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Now there's some key words there. Did you hear them? belong, family, member. Are you getting the idea? In fact, I've come to realize that when you decide to start following Christ, you become a member of a second family. You have your family of origin, that family that gave you birth, the family that you were raised with, whether you were raised in foster care or you were adopted or you're raised in a traditional family or a strange family, whatever. You have that first family, your family of origin. But there's also a second family. When you become a follower of Christ, you become a member of God's family. Just look around at you and say, hey, cousin, just tell them that right now. You can talk in church, it's okay. Just tell them, uncle, aunt, whatever they are, grandpa, grandma. You see, a lot of people think the church is a club. For the religiously constipated. And I've been to some churches like that. Other people think the church is an organization. It has all these rules and regulations that you have to follow. Some people think that the church is is sort of a religious place that you go to for spiritual things. Like weddings and funerals and occasionally on Easter and Christmas. Other people think that the church is an institution or a denomination. Here's what God says. He says it's none of that. The church is what? About, okay, I I got some work to do today. I can tell that right now. The church is what? A family. Exactly. You just welcomed each other and you already forgot. You're a family. You are the family of God. These are your family members. You may not even know all of them today because some of you sit in the same spot every week. And I, I, one of these days, I'm just going to make sure your spot is missing to make you sit somewhere else, okay? We're going to move the chairs around and make the st- stage go this way or something. Just because we get into a routine and we don't know other members of the family. And, and so I want to encourage you today to look at this whole concept of the church as a family. In fact, a Christian without a church is an orphan. Now think about that. See, I've had pe- people come and they say to me, so they say, All right. I believe you can be a Christian without a church. (laughs) And I'm here to tell you that makes you an orphan because you're part of God's family. Whether you want to be in it or not, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you become part of God's family. Members, belong, family. We just read about it in the Bible. You're automatically placed in the heart of God to become part of his family. You say, well, where did all this start? Well, think about this back in the Garden of Eden. Adam, Eve, the whole thing going on, great. The Bible says in Genesis 1 that that Adam and Eve were made in the, what, image of God. That is, they were given a spirit. 
Now, animals have souls. Some people say, well, I don't know that animals are going to be in heaven because they don't have a soul. Well, the Bible says they have souls. That's another whole message. But what they don't have is a spirit. The spirit of God was placed in us as humans. And that spirit enables us to commune, to relate to, to have fellowship with, to talk with God. We're the only creature that God made that, that he made with a spirit. So the animal doesn't have a spirit. Only we as humans have a spirit to relate to God. And Adam and Eve, it was perfect. They walked in the coolness of the garden. They related to God every day. Whenever God wanted to talk or they wanted to talk, they were there. They related through their spirit. But remember, all at once a snake shows up. And the snake says to Eve, hey, would you like to be like God? Well, yeah, I'd like to be like God. Well, then eat of the tree. Remember, he, he does this little seductive thing, and he entices her, and later she entices Adam to do the one thing. I've always thought, Martin, about this. The one thing that God said they couldn't do, they still couldn't keep one rule that was negative, and they busted that rule. And so because of that, they, the, 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 the Bible says that the devil was trying to say, you know, well, what will happen if, well, if we eat of that tree? You know, then, then we're going uh, to lose our life. We're going to die. Now, it's interesting, though, in the Bible, Adam lived to be 930 years old. So he didn't die when he sinned against God. Are, are you tracking? I'm giving you some theology here without you knowing it. Adam didn't die. What he did was he became spiritually separated from God in his spirit. His spirit died. Are you, are you getting this? And so when the Bible says in Ephesians, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. Everyone prior to Christ is dead to God. Are, are you getting this? Now, people say to me all the time, well, you know, we're all made in the image of God. No, only Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. I'm going to give you some, this is going to mess you up today, okay? Just put your theology books aside. I'm going to give you the Bible today. Because God says in Genesis 1, he made Adam and Eve in the image of God. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1, when Adam has his first son, the Bible says, and he, that is his first son, was made in the likeness of Adam. Not in the image of God, but in the likes of Adam. Why? Because Adam is separated from God because of his sin. His spirit has become dead to God. So he could only reproduce what he was. Are are you getting this? So this messed up, I'm I'm, I'm letting you know why we have so much trouble in the world today. People say all the time, why so much suffering? Why so much uh, 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 just leadership messing up? And and why, why all this craziness in our world? Why do people die of cancer? And why does this happen? One thing, folks, We messed it up when we popped the lid off sin's box and we let sin out of the box. And that polluted the whole world. So we're all messed up. Before I accepted Christ, I was a misfit. I was messed up. I created messes in other people's lives. People would say, he's a mess. And they were right because I was without Christ. So I'm dead in my trespasses and sins in my spirit. I'm alive, breathing, talking, but I'm dead in my spirit. To God, or, or, this basic theology 101, but some of you need to rehear it one more time. So you say, well, what happened? Well, the whole story of Jesus Christ is the story, isn't it, of Jesus coming and being the sacrifice for that sin. Once and for all, Jesus made it possible because of him coming and living inside of us when we invite him into our hearts. We then have the spirit of Jesus inside of us, and now we can commune, relate to God. Isn't that wonderful? So my spirit is reunited to God, not because of my religious works. So I want to just help some of you that are trying to work your way to heaven. You can relax. Because it isn't going to work. Now, how, no matter how much you work for God, works don't get you into heaven. There's only one way in, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he's got a you in his name. We just found that out today, right? <laughs> I mean, I think that's marvelous what God did. I mean, God could have said, you know, pray this many prayers. Count this many uh, prayer beads on your prayer bead uh, necklace. He could have said, turn this wheel like they do in, in the Hindu religion. He could have said all these things to get to him. But he, he says, you invite Jesus in, and the spirit of Jesus comes inside of you so that we can have relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden. It's reestablished in Jesus Christ. You have new life in Jesus Christ. That's why Colossians 1 says, The hope of Jesus, the hope of glory lives inside of you. And so what happens? Jesus lives his life through you and in you. It isn't you doing it. It's Jesus doing it through you. So you don't have to work. You don't have to do better. You don't have to serve better. You don't have to be better. Jesus is better because he's inside of you. You're better. (laughs) We ought to get at least four claps for that, right? 
I mean, it's amazing. You say, why are you telling us all this? I thought this was a message on the church. Because you can't understand the church until you understand Jesus who makes the church possible. Now, I'm not talking about the church you grew up in that was a mess. I'm not talking about the church that we've all been at bad churches where, you know, we got ruined by some uh, leader or we got ruined by some Sunday school. My, mine was Mrs. Fields who constantly shook, she was four foot six and constantly shook her little finger in my face and said, you're a bad little boy. <laughs> Incidentally, she was saying that to me when I was 18. <laughs> and I was a bad little boy. Because in sin, I cannot be good. I can do good things, but I'm not good. In my flesh, I can do good things. But once I receive Jesus, you say, what does that have to do with the church? I'm about to get there, so hang on. So when I get in Jesus, and my spirit is now right with God again, I'm in proper alignment, now I can commune with God and have relationship with God. I, I'm now reestablished in what sin destroyed in the Garden of Eden. I'm reestablished in Jesus Christ. Then... Then, when I receive Christ, I become part not of just my family, I become part of God's family. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, think about it this way. I'm going to give you another metaphor. We said he's a bride. We said that the church is a family. Here's the third one. It's a gym. G-Y-M. Now, how many of you go to the gym? I was going to say you look like it, but I mean, you know, I won't, I won't be that, you know, I mean, we all need to go to the gym, don't we? We need to, you know, I mean, I, my doctor gets on me all the time. He says, you need to go to the gym. I can't understand why you're the healthiest member of your family, but you need to go to the gym. So I, I think about it a lot. I pray about it often. <laughs> you can tell I haven't been. But here's what the church is as a gym. God is the owner of the gym. Jesus is the general manager. And pastors and teachers are the personal trainers for you. Now, what's a personal trainer do? I, I love this. Here's what a personal trainer does. They make you do things you don't want to do, right? Isn't that true? Because we're a family, right? So I, when my kids would say, I'd say, eat your vegetables. they say, Dad, we don't do broccoli. What do you mean you don't do broccoli? Eat your broccoli. Or, or do your homework. Dad, we don't have any homework. I know you got homework because I saw it when you brought it in. I checked your backpack. You checked our backpack? Yes, I'm your dad. I can check your backpack anyway, anytime I want to. My kids still know that I'll check their phones if I have to, you know, because I know all their passwords. They don't think I know it, but I'll check their phone. I want to know who they're talking to. I got two girls. So, so the, the church is a gym. So here's what a gym, uh, here's what a personal trainer does. A personal trainer says, they, they're, they encourage you, right? Come on, you can do one more rep. Or they'll say something like, yeah, you did great. Now give me one more rep. And you go, no, my, my, my hands are going like this, and I'm sweating, and I'm going to die, and you're going to kill me right here. But that trainer knows that when I push myself beyond my limits, I become stronger, right? Oh, I just gave you a theological truth right there. When pastors and teachers push, your, push you beyond what you think you can do spiritually, it's for your spiritual benefit. We're not out to hurt you. We're not out to make you feel bad. We're out to make you shaped into spiritual maturity so you can be as closely connected to God as you can be. So the church is almost like a gym. We come not just to sit and to worship and to hear a message. We come to be trained in spiritual stuff. We come to be pushed to go beyond our limits. We, we come to be stretched so we can be mature in Jesus Christ because I've got everything I need in Christ we see that in Ephesians. We see that in 2 Peter chapter 1. Everything in Christ we have inside of us, but we don't know it's all there. See, there are muscles. When I work out, which isn't very often, Christmas and Easter, about like how some of you go to church. And so when I do work out twice a year, man, my body is in major revolt, revolt the next day. Muscles I didn't even know I had are screaming, don't do that ever again. What we do as a church is we push you, we train you, we, we call you, we challenge you because we know you're going to be better in the end. Is there going to be some suffering and hurt as you go through it? Listen, all truth stretches me, right? 
All truth makes me a better person, but it, it's painful as I'm going through it. So, so we have to remember, folks, that the church is a bride, beautiful. It is a family, wonderful. But it's also a gem that trains us in spiritual things. You say, well, what does all that mean? Well, look in your Bibles. I'm, I'm finally going to preach here. First Thessalonians chapter 2. And we just spend these last 15 minutes talking to you about how this works out in practical action. And at the end, in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you a very important question. First of all, I'm going to ask you, are you in the family? Are you in the family of God? And secondly, have you become part of a family and dedicated yourself to being trained there and served there and work as a team, as a family? So those are two questions we're going to ask at the end. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Look on your outline again. Look again at this whole bride thing. What is this bride like? Just four or five things. We probably won't get to all of them, but I'll get to as many as I can. Here's the first one. She is full of delight. Full of delight. First Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, actually. Look in verse 2. Paul says, We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continue to remember before God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, what, what is Paul saying? He's saying, listen, when you are part of the family, there's some things that are taking place in your life And in the midst of tough times, in the midst of of being strained past your limits, in the midst of being pushed beyond what you thought were capable, you are having an impact. And when you have an impact with your life on other people, you feel better. I mean, the other day I stopped and helped this person uh, change the tire on their car. And they didn't know how to use, I mean, isn't it amazing? We don't teach kids today how to balance a checkbook uh, because everything's electronic. We have not taught kids either, in most cases, how to change a simple thing like a tire. And so this is a little, you know, I don't know, 19, 18-year-old uh, kid, and he didn't know how to change a tire. And he said, I, I called my dad, but he can't come for several hours, and, and I don't know what to do. I said, do you have a lug wrench? He goes, what? <laughs> okay, do you have a spare tire? Well, where would it be? So I said, give me the keys and let me take over. (laughs) And so we changed it. He was, there's there's bolts on the tire. I didn't know that. I said, yes, hold them and don't lose them. If you lose them, we're in trouble. And I showed him how to change this tire. Now, I didn't want to do it. I had grease all over me. I was dressed up for a meeting. I didn't want, but I did it because, and and afterwards, even though I was grousing while I was doing it, because those, those lug nuts were on there pretty tight. Man, when I got done, I felt better. He looked like he had when I first met him, I mean, because he didn't do any work. But, 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 but even though I felt a little tired and I was hot and, and I had grease all over me, I feel good. See, when you have an impact in somebody's life, don't you feel better? And so Paul was saying to the Thessalonian church, even in the midst of all this stuff happening to you, man, you are a delight because you're making an impact with your life. Here's the second thing about a bride. A bride has imperfections imperfections. You say, well, what does that mean? It means this. <laughs> I mean, you know that every one of your children, if you have children, has flaws. They become more evident when they get in middle school. The lid comes off in middle school. High school, they're, you're just numb, and by the time they get married and they're out on their own, they're coming to you to deal with the problems that they have, right? Because we all have flaws. We all have imperfections. But aren't you glad? I'm glad that my parents, I was sick the first 16 months. I had this blood disease when I was a kid. For 16 months, I was sick and screamed all night. I'm so glad my parents just didn't, uh, you know, turn me out and throw me on the streets just because I had imperfections. Aren't you? I'm glad that I didn't get married to Pat and discover a mole in a place I didn't know that she had and go, oh my gosh, where'd you get that? (laughs) But but, But I'm looking for the perfect church. Don't go there. You'll mess it up. Why? Because we all have imperfections. We've all got certain things that, you know, we just, we just haven't gotten rid of and things that are just weird and strange in our life. And, 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 that, and that's why, folks, that's why the church is a family that cares about one another. Where, 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 the, where Jesus says these strange things, he says the church is a place where the first are last and enemies are loved and, 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 and strong are weak and rich are poor and where prejudice and bigotry are beyond, are, are banned and beyond our comp- comprehension. It's, it's, it's a, see, the church is a place where 
chamber of grace for every race. It's a place where anybody and everybody can come and be part of the family. A church is a place where even the most messed up sinner can walk in and sit next to the best saint we've got. And God looks at both of them the same. The play, well, I'm talking about grace here. What makes us a family is not because we are perfect. It's because we got grace. And when I look at you and your imperfections, grace comes over me. And I I don't want to say one thing, but I I bless you and say something else because that's what grace does. I remember when I went to West Virginia 33 years ago to plant a church. And and, and, in that little town, everybody that was white went to the white churches. And everybody that was African American went to the black churches. And and Asians, I don't guess they went anywhere because there was no there was no churches for them. That was all that was the all alternatives. Latinos, I don't know where they went. And I can remember when the first African American family joined our church. He was the vice president of Shepherd University, and he drove by and he said, I "Almost didn't come to your church." And I said, "Why, Al?" He goes, "Because all I saw in the parking lot were minivans." He says, "Black people don't drive minivans." Now this is the 1980s, you late 1980s. I didn't know that. And he came, and eventually our church in this, and, and listen, when, when we first started adopting uh, people that were not of our, of our original race, of the people that started the church, I mean, it created quite a stir. Remember, this is not Delaware. This is West Virginia. They still fly Confederate flags in their yard and have pickup trucks with the Confederate flag on the back of the pickup truck. And I don't see those in Delaware, but you go to West Virginia, you're going to see a lot of them. And I can remember getting notes on my car of people saying, why are you allowing them in our church? And I said, I'm allowing them in our church because it isn't about them, it's about him. And he died for their sins just as he died for your white sins. And I'm about to say something else, but I won't. And, and I remember when the first Latinos came and, and, and then I found out that, that African Americans, a lot of them don't like Latinos. And, and they began to ask me, why are you letting all those Latinos in? And, and I went, What? See, God's family is made up of people from every race because the Bible says in Revelation as it pictures heaven, I saw people there from every nation waving palm branches, worshiping the king. And so folks, listen, we don't have to wait to heaven to start celebrating that in our diversity we're united around the son of God. We start today and we draw the line on all bigotry and prejudice and hate crimes. We draw a line and say, it will not be allowed in this place. Because this is a place of grace for every race. And if that offends you, go find another church. I can suggest some to you in West Virginia. <laughs> Watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. What is a family? I'm almost done, I promise you. But, but here, here's what I'm just, see, here's, here's what a family does. Here's a here's C on your outline. She speaks a biblical message. She speaks the truth. Again, in Thessalonians chapter two, go back there with me just real quickly. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter two and verse four. When Paul is writing to this church, he says, on the contrary, we speak as men approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please men, but God who tests our hearts. What, what is he saying there? He's saying that when we speak to you, we give you the truth. We don't always like to hear it, do we? But, but God gives us his truth. I don't always like when somebody comes up to me and says, Ron, you're acting like a jerk. And I say, well, not as bad as I used to be, <laughs> you know. I think I've improved a little bit, but then I realized that they're trying to speak the truth into my life. I'll never forget speaking to a bunch of college students at Shepherd University one time, about 75 of them there, and uh, this was probably in the late 1990s, and we had started a college ministry. It was just incredible what God did there. Uh, In fact, many of them were hired as part of our staff, and almost all of them are still there at that same church, and and I remember just doing, they asked me to do a talk on uh, sex education. I'm like, okay, and so... I went and I said, look, I, you know more about sex than I do. This is the way I started the talk. And because uh, I was raised in an age where you just didn't talk about it. So we're not gonna talk about that. What we're gonna talk about is this. We're gonna talk about how to keep your body holy. And I said, uh, guys, I said, Here, here's how you keep your body holy. Here's how you do it. This, this is what I learned. Because when I met Pat, I think I told you this one time, 
she, you know, had never been with a guy, and we didn't have sex. I'm just telling you, I'm just being honest, we just, we didn't have sex before marriage. I know that's rare today, but we didn't. I don't know how I did it, but we did it, okay? So, I mean, her, it didn't seem to be a problem, but, you know, I was like, oh, please, God, you know, marry me today, you know? And, uh, I mean, come on, I was only 20. Today, it's like, uh, it's 730 on Friday night, I'm going to bed. <laughs> you know? used to say, are you coming with me? And I just say, leave me alone, you know. And so I say, here's, here's how you keep your body, here's how you keep your body holy. When you're at home alone, I'll try to do this in a PG version, or the back seat of the car, wherever you are. My day was the back seat of the car. As you begin to touch her, guys, just remember, you're touching Jesus. Because the spirit of Jesus lives inside of her. <laughs> yeah, you can hear this collective groan all through the room, you know. Like, what? And I said, honey, as he's touching you, just remember, he's not Jesus right then. If he's touching you inappropriately. Are, are you tracking with me? And so you just tell him, huh, treat me like Jesus. You just say that to him right then. It kills the mood. I, I swear, it kills the mood. <laughs> Joe, it'll kill the mood. Just tell the team, it'll kill the mood. <laughs> so why are you telling us this? I'm telling you this because I've got a point here to make. I forgot what it was, but I've got a point here to make. Here, here it is. It's truth. And so I remember I, I did this whole talk, and, and it was like five minutes long and a lot shorter than I'm preaching to you right now. And, and, and one of the guys came up afterwards, and he said, thank you. I thought he was going to deck me, you know. He said, why? I said, why? He said, of all the speakers we've ever had, you're the only one that ever told us the truth. That sex is to be waited upon until a man and a woman become united in marriage. You're the only one that's ever told us that. Our churches don't tell us that. Our pastors don't tell us that. Our college leaders don't tell us that. You're the only one. And he said, you gave me hope because the next time I touch, and I forget Lucy or whatever her name was, I'm gonna, I, I, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. See, that's what, isn't that what churches are supposed to do? Reverend Al, isn't that what, I mean, isn't that what we're, we're supposed to tell you the truth? And see, today in this world, everybody is telling us to be politically correct. There's no call in the Bible to be politically correct. We've got to be biblically correct. And that doesn't mean to be negative. That doesn't mean we, 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 we disown people or, or we ignore people or we push them out. Or What it means is we tell people the truth. And there's people out there that just want to know, is anybody out there telling the truth? It's got to be the church. So if you come here, I'm just telling you that are visiting with us today, if you come here, you're going to hear the truth. Not to exclude you, not to, not to make you feel bad, although sometimes the truth does make you feel bad. But the truth is designed so that you can live in proper relationship with God and enjoy all the benefits of being properly aligned with God. That's what a bride does. Can I give you one more? Because I think this is important. i got to end here because our time is gone and forget the others. I'll just I'll preach that another time. But here's the last thing about a bride. Because I want you to get this. She's loving in her mindset. Watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. See, our definition of love today is this. Our definition of love is emotional attachment driven by our glands. Wouldn't you agree? Okay. <laughs> so when I'm flipping the uh, grandkids were over last night, I don't know why, but they were. And um, Pat says, they're spending the night with us. And I didn't know that. So there goes Saturday night, you know. And, uh, you know, it's Saturday night. <laughs> Some of you will get that on the drive home. And, and I'm flipping channels, and I got on this one thing where uh, the grandkids are, like, watching, you know, me as I'm flipping channels. I'm trying to find Barbie. I, I, Barbie is gone. I don't know what happened to Barbie. I think she died finally. She deserved to in 1957, but, you know, I think she's done. But, but man, all once, whatever we were on, we got on this channel, and, like, there was this cussing going on. And immediately, my grandkids looked at me and said, said, said uh, Pappy, 
Pappy, they're not saying very nice words, are they? And I couldn't, I was like trying to push the button and couldn't get it off the channel. And, it, and it, they're going on and on. And I'm like, I think the battery's dying on our remote. I don't know why it was the devil possessed it. I don't know what happened. But there's so much stuff out there that's trying to pull us away from the truth. And yet the bride of Jesus, in spite of that, is loving in her mindset. And so, and so love, isn't, love isn't about our glands or emotional attachment. Because here's what's going to happen. Young ladies, listen to me very important. He may look good now, but at 54, he's going to be bald and fat and smell bad. And guys, you may be going, looking at her going, wampa, wampa now. But she becomes the devil in high heels at some point. And so you can't go on looks alone. I mean, you know, I used to have, I used to have packs, I think they call them now, you know. Now I got man boobs. I don't know what's going on. But, but you know, but I, I, I mean, I had, I mean, my chest was, uh, yeah, you can say that in church. And, um, and, and I, you know, my, I mean, my, my wife was, but see, my wife wasn't drawn because of my athletic look back when I was 22 and she married me. Because now all that stuff has gone south. Now I got a kangaroo pouch, you know. See, love can't be on the basis of looks. Love can't be on the basis of, we say sometimes like, love, I love ice cream. But, but if that's the way you love God, are you getting this? So what does that mean? It means this. I'm going to close with this. If there's anything that ought to brand a church, it's love. That's why you don't see my picture in the bulletin. Because I don't want the church to be about me. That's why you don't see my picture on the church bus. We don't even have a church bus. What am I saying? You get the idea, right? Because this isn't about the pulpit. This isn't about a person. This isn't about an organization. This isn't about a club. This isn't about a religion. This isn't about an institution. This isn't about a denomination. It's all about one thing, Jesus and his bride. And they have a love relationship with one another. And so because of that love relationship, they have a family. And that means the family have a love relationship with one. That's why Mike and I stand at the back. And he's somewhat more of an introvert than I am. But, but I see him greeting people. And it costs him desperately to do that. Because he's, you know, introverts is a lot of emotional energy. He's not a severe introvert. He's just got a mild case of it. But you get the idea, you know. But why does he do that? Because he truly loves you. That's why I got somebody in the back up the other day. I said, why do you come in here and sit here at 1045? You ought to be up loving on people. Well, I don't hug. You don't have to hug them. They don't want you to hug them. I don't want you to hug me. But love them. Express love. People don't know they're loved unless you tell them your love. You say, well, how do you do that? So here's my challenge for next week. All you that sit in the back. <laughs> I'm going to pick on you just a moment. Next week, I want you all up. Don't sit until Martin says to sit down at the last song and be up and around saying to people, I am so glad you're here today. I love you and so does God. And welcome to the family. I don't care what you say. Just make sure the boogers are out of your nose and, and your glasses are on right and, and your breath doesn't stink and greet people because this is a house of love. That's what our brand is from this day forward. We are a place of grace for every race and we are a household of love. And love is intentional. It goes towards people. It moves towards needs. And folks, my, 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 my call to you this morning, because I'm out of time, is this. Can I do one more minute? Do we have that? Okay, one more minute. Every Christian is a part of two families. Your family of origin and the church that you belong to. And here's my thing. Some of you are saying, Rob, that's all great. You're a funny guy. I don't know. I mean, whatever you're thinking. You're an idiot. I, you may be I don't know what you're thinking. But I want to say this to you. You can't be in the second family until you know the bridegroom. That's why we preach Jesus with a you. 
That's why we call people to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior because you can't get in the church. I know if you're raised Catholic, they say, oh, get baptized as a baby, and you're, that doesn't make you part of the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm telling you the truth. I, I'm just, I, just getting wet doesn't make you a believer. You gotta come to a conscious decision in your life where you say, I want the bridegroom. You say, well, I'm a Presbyterian, sorry. I'm an I'm a Episcopalian, God's chosen frozen. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You can be all those things and more, but if you don't have the bridegroom, you can't get the bride. Because it takes two to make a relationship. And so what God is saying to you today, two things. One is he's saying to all of you that have never gotten into relationship with the bridegroom, today is your day. 2 Corinthians 10 says, now is the day of salvation. You can have Jesus in your heart today by simply coming to him today and saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Man, I am messed up. I need you in my life to change me. Come into my life and wash me clean and make me who I ought to be. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, he comes in. That's what we call becoming a Christian. I want you to think about that for a moment because there's a second group in here today. And there's some of you here today that have been coming to this church for weeks or months or maybe even years, but you've never become part of this family. I want you to know, man, we need you here. We need you here to, to belong. We need you here to, to serve. We need you here to give. Those are all wonderful things, but most of all, we need you here because we need you. You add to value, to the value of this church. When you step out and you become part of what God's doing here, you add to this church. And we call you brother and sister, not because it's a religious phrase, but, but because we're family. And there may be some of you here today that would say today, you know, Ron, yeah, today. I'm already a Christian, but I'm not part of a church. Not part of this church, but I want to be a part. In just a moment, our deacons and their wise guys, if you go ahead and come forward, and if you all stand with me, everyone will stand with me.